An Inside Look at Editorial Cartoons by Bill Brennan A few weeks ago, Joy Utecht, the journalism teacher at Grand Island Senior High, asked if I could visit with some of her students about editorial cartoons. The invitation was exciting because editorial cartoons are one of my favorite subjects. Very few items are as unique to a newspaper as editorial cartoons. A very brief history lesson. Editorial cartoons first appeared in the United States on single-page broadsheets during the colonial times. The first popular cartoon is a snake severed into 13 parts, with the names of each colony by each piece. The caption is simple. Divided, we die. Such a theme helped the colonies, with their diverse locations and interests, unite under a common cause. Flash forward to the years in New York City after the Civil War when Tammany Hall became such a powerful political machine that it nearly sucked the life out of its residents. In addition, William Tweed stole millions from the taxpayers. Eventually, the New York Times and eventually law enforcement officials began investigations of the Tweed Ring, but it was the powerful cartoons of Nast that brought the politicians to their knees. At one point, Nast, who worked for Harper's Weekly, turned down a bribe of $500,000 to discontinue his cartoons. Instead, Nast made Tweed the most recognizable face in America. When Tweed tried to flee conviction, he was arrested in Spain because authorities recognized his face from Nast's cartoons. By the way, Nast deserves partial credit for another icon, one that has stood the test of time. Along with an artist named Clement Moore, Nast drew the first Santa Claus, Photography became a part of American newspapers and magazines as early as the Civil War, but the process was difficult, and illustrations remained a part of American newspapers until early into the 20th century. But the sketches known as editorial cartoons are as popular today as they ever have been. People love the humor, simplicity, and caricatures of politicians of the day. Caricatures, I told the students at senior high, are exaggerations of one's physical features. In recent years, there have been the JFK haircut, the LBJ ears, the Nixon eyebrows, the Carter teeth, and the Clinton jaw. Of course, each cartoonist has his or her own style, but it is amazing how they reach out to the same features to identify a politician. A good editorial cartoon must have five basic features. It must be simple. People must understand it. The cartoon must make sense to those who read the particular paper. A school newspaper might run a cartoon about cafeteria food that includes an inside joke and isn't readily understood by the general public. The cartoon would only make sense in the school newspaper. The cartoon must be timely. It must evoke emotion. A good cartoon should make people laugh or make them mad. Always the cartoon must give a point of view. The cartoon may be looking at the truth, but it usually is coming from a specific viewpoint. When we look down at an object, the viewpoint is very different when we look up at the object. Editorial cartoons are the same way. The independent doesn't always agree with the viewpoint of each cartoon in the paper. Most certainly, the readers don't always agree with them. But we all should agree that political cartoons are thought-provoking, just like a photograph. A well-illustrated editorial cartoon can be worth a thousand words. There probably are about 100 newspapers, give or take a few, that employ full-time cartoonists. Unfortunately, it is a luxury that only metropolitan-sized newspapers can afford. Smaller newspapers subscribe to syndicated features for the right to reprint some of the better cartoons that have been published. The next time you look at an editorial cartoon in the newspaper, Try to look at it a new way. Instead of thinking about just whether you agree or disagree with the message, see if the cartoons have the five basic components to it. Then you can determine whether the message is getting through.